The Twenty-Four Hours of the Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ By the Servant of God, Louisa Picoretta, Little Daughter of the Divine Will Presentation This book is a translation of the Italian book L'Orologio della Passione di Nostro Signore Gesù Cristo written by Luisa Picaretta, the little daughter of the Divine Will, about the year 1914. In obedience to the ecclesiastical authority at that time, the now Saint Anibale Maria di Francia. This presentation was taken largely from the preface of the fourth edition, which Saint Anibale Maria di Francia had written for the original Italian Louisa was 17 years old. She relates these facts in the first of 36 volumes which she wrote by order of holy obedience. On the last day of a Christmas novena which Jesus himself prompted her to do, he surprised her with an unusually vivid experience of the marvelous mysteries of his love. And he told her he wanted to lavish new and greater graces on her, manifesting to her other even more lofty excesses of his immense love, and inviting her to continue giving him uninterrupted company during the twenty-four hours of his sorrowful passion and death. Much later, after Louisa had already been living these hours of the passion intensely in her interior for more than thirty years, the now Saint Anibale de Francia who was the ecclesiastic delegate on matters concerning Louisa's writings, and who had come to know about this practice of hers, gave her the obedience to write these hours down. This, then, is how the book, The Hours of the Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, began. It was then that St. Anibale de Francia published it for the first time. To this edition there followed seven others, five in Italian and two in German, always with the proper ecclesiastical permissions. It was recently published in English and Spanish as well. When Louisa had finished writing the Hours of the Passion, she wrote a letter which she gave to St. Anibale, together with the book, who included it in the book's preface when he published it. From this letter, we come to appreciate how pleased Jesus is, and how many benefits are lavished upon the soul when it practices these hours on a daily basis, as bread without which one cannot live. Here is the letter. I am finally sending you this handwritten copy of the Hours of the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. May it all be for his greater glory. I have also enclosed a few sheets on which I have described the effects and the beautiful promises which Jesus makes to all those who meditate these hours of the Passion. I believe that if whoever meditates on them is a sinner, he will convert. If he is imperfect, he will become perfect. If he is holy, he will become holier. If he is tempted, he will find victory. If suffering, he will find strength, medicine, and comfort in these hours. If weak and poor, he will find a spiritual food and a mirror in which to look at himself continually, and so become beautiful and similar to Jesus, our model. Jesus' joy is so immense when someone meditates on the hours of the Passion that he would like to see at least one copy of these meditations being used in every city and town, because then it would be as if Jesus were hearing his own voice and his own prayers, which he raised to his Father during the twenty-four hours of his painful Passion. And if this is done at least by a few souls in each town and city, he himself promises that the divine justice will be appeased in part, and punishments will be lessened. 
Reverend Father, you make an appeal to everyone. Bring this little work to completion which my loving Jesus has had me do. I would also like to add that the purpose of these hours of the Passion is not so much that of recounting the story of the Passion, since there already are many books which deal with this pious subject, and it would not be necessary to write another one. Instead, its purpose is to make reparation, to unite ourselves to Jesus in each of the different moments of his Passion and, with his own divine will, make a worthy reparation for each of the various offenses he receives and compensate him for everything that all creatures owe him. From this there derive the different ways of making reparation in these hours. In some instances the soul blesses him, in others it sympathizes with him, in others it praises him. It comforts suffering Jesus, it compensates him, it begs, prays, and asks him, and so on. So I entrust to you the task of making known the purpose of these hours to those who will read them. Therefore, in every city, town, and nation, let us form so many cenacles in which these twenty-four hours of the Passion of our Lord are meditated and lived. Like so many living clocks, let them faithfully mark the hours of each day to keep Jesus company with our love, our reparation, and our gratitude, for he is not loved as he deserves. Indeed, his own children offend him and crucify him again in their hearts by closing the doors to grace, to the divine will. It happened that on one occasion... St. Anibale de Francia went to Luisa's house and recounted what had taken place on one of his visits with the Pope. Being an intimate friend of Pope St. Pius X, he was frequently received by him. While with him, he wanted to introduce him to the book, The Hours of the Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, which he had been spreading. So he read a few pages of it to him specifically from the hour of the crucifixion. At a certain point, the Pope interrupted him, saying, Father, this book should be read while kneeling. It is Jesus Christ who is speaking. This concludes the presentation. Promises of Jesus for whoever prays the hours of the Passion from the writings of Louisa Picaretta. Volume 11, April 10th, 1913. Tell me, my good, what will you give as a reward to those who will do the hours of the Passion the way you taught them to me? And he, my daughter, I will not look at these hours as your things, but as things done by me. I will give you the same merits as if I were in the act of suffering my passion. In this way I will let you obtain the same effects according to the dispositions of the souls, this while on earth. And I could not give you a greater thing from my own. Then in heaven I will place these souls in front of me, flashing them with lightnings of love and contentment, for as many times as they did the hours of my passion, while they will flash to me as well. What a sweet enchantment this will be for all the blessed! Volume 11, September 6, 1913 I was thinking about the hours of the passion which have now been written and how they are without any indulgence. So those who do them do not gain anything, while there are many prayers enriched with many indulgences. While I was thinking of this, my always adorable Jesus, all kindness told me, My daughter, one gains something through the prayers with indulgences, but the hours of my passion, which are my own prayers, my reparations, 
and all my love came really from the depth of my heart. Did you perhaps forget how many times I united myself with you to do them together? And I turned chastisements into graces over the entire earth? So my satisfaction is such that instead of the indulgence, I give the soul a handful of love, which contains infinite love of incalculable price. Further, when things are done for pure love, my love finds its outpouring, and it is not inconsiderable that the creature can give relief and expression to the love of her Creator. Volume 11, October 1914 I was writing the hours of the Passion, and I thought to myself, how many sacrifices in order to write these blessed hours of the Passion, especially to put on paper certain interior acts which had passed only between me and Jesus. What reward will he give to me? Letting me hear his tender and sweet voice, Jesus told me, My daughter, as a reward for having written the hours of my passion, for each word you have written, I will give you a kiss, a soul. And I, my love, this is for me, and what will you give to those who will do them? And Jesus, if they do them together with me, and with my own will, I will give them a soul for each word they will recite, because the greater or lesser effectiveness of these hours of my passion is in the greater or lesser union that they have with me. In doing them with my will, the creature hides inside my volition, and since it is my volition that is acting, I can produce all the goods I want even through one single word, this for each time you will do them. Another time I was lamenting with Jesus, because after so many sacrifices to write these hours of the Passion, very few were the souls who were doing them. And he, My daughter, do not lament. Even if there was only one, you should be happy. Wouldn't I have suffered all my passion, even to save only one soul? The same for you. One should never omit good, only because few benefit from it. All the harm is for those who do not take advantage of it. Just as my passion made my humanity acquire the merit as if all were being saved, although not all are saved, since my will was to save everyone, and I received merit according to what I wanted, not according to the profit which creatures would have drawn, the same is for you. You will be rewarded depending on whether your will identified itself with mine, wanting to benefit all. All the evil remains to those who, although being able to, do not do it. These hours are the most precious of all, because they are nothing other than the repetition of what I did in the course of my mortal life, and what I continue to do in the Most Blessed Sacrament. When I hear these hours of my passion, I hear my own voice, my own prayers. In that soul, I see my will, that is, wanting good for everyone and wanting to repair for all. And I feel moved to dwell in her, in order to do whatever she does within her. Oh, how I would love that even one single soul for each town did these hours of my passion. I would hear myself in every town, and my justice, greatly indignant during these times, would remain partly appeased. Volume 11, 
October 13th, 1916. I was doing the hours of the Passion, and blessed Jesus told me, My daughter, in the course of my mortal life, thousands and thousands of angels were the cortege of my humanity, gathering everything I did, my steps, my works, my words, and even my sighs, my pains, the drops of my blood, in sum, everything. They were the angels in charge of my custody, and of paying me honor. Obedient to my every wish, they would rise to and descend from heaven to bring to the Father what I was doing. Now these angels have a special office, and as the soul remembers my life, my passion, my blood, my wounds, my prayers, they come around this soul and gather her words, her prayers, her acts of compassion for me, her tears and her offerings. They unite them to mine, and they bring them before my majesty to renew for me the glory of my own life. The delight of the angels is so great that reverent, they listen to what the soul says and pray together with her. So with what attention and respect must the soul do these hours, thinking that the angels hang upon her lips to repeat after her what she says? Volume 12, May 16, 1917 Then I found myself outside of myself. I was in the midst of many souls. They seemed to be purging souls and saints, who were speaking to me and mentioning one person known to me who died not too long ago. And they said to me, He feels happy at seeing that there is not a soul who enters purgatory without carrying the mark of the hours of the Passion. Surrounded by the cortege of these hours, and helped by them, the souls take a safe place. And there is not a soul who flies into heaven without being accompanied by these hours of the Passion. These hours make a continuous dew pour down from heaven to earth, into purgatory, and even into heaven. On hearing this, I said to myself, Maybe my beloved Jesus! to keep the word he had given, that for each word of the hour of the passion he would give a soul, is allowing that there be not a saved soul who does not benefit from these hours. Afterwards I returned into myself, and as I found my sweet Jesus, I asked him whether that was true. And he, these hours are the order of the universe. They put heaven and earth in harmony, and restrain me from sending the world to ruin. I feel my blood, my wounds, my love, and all I did, being placed in circulation, and they flow over all to save all. As souls do these hours of the Passion, I feel my blood, my wounds, my anxieties to save souls being put in motion, and I feel my own life being repeated. How could creatures obtain any good if not by means of these hours? Why do you doubt? This thing is not yours, but mine. You have been the strained and weak instrument. Volume 22 June 17, 1927 After this I found myself outside of myself, and while looking for my sweet Jesus, I encountered Father de Francia. He was all cheerful, and he told me, Do you know how many beautiful surprises I found? I did not think it would be so when I was on earth though I thought I had done good by publishing the Hours of the Passion. 
But the surprise is I found our marvelous, enchanting, of a rarity never before seen. All the words regarding the passion of our Lord changed into light, one more beautiful than the other, all braided together. And these lights grow more and more as creatures do the hours of the passion, so more lights add to the first. But what surprised me the most were the few sayings published by me about the divine will. Each saying changed into a sun, and these suns, investing all the lights with their rays, form such a surprise of beauty that one remains enraptured, enchanted. You cannot imagine how surprised I was at seeing myself in the midst of these lights and these suns. How content I was. And I thanked our highest good, Jesus, who had given me the occasion and the grace to do it. You too, thank him on my behalf. The 24 Hours of the Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ Luisa Piccareta, The Little Daughter of the Divine Will Preparation Before Each Hour O oh, my Lord Jesus Christ, prostrate in your divine presence, I implore your most loving heart to admit me to the sorrowful meditation of the twenty-four hours in which for love of us you wanted to suffer so much in your adorable body and in your most holy soul unto death on the cross. Oh, please, give me help, grace, love, deep compassion and understanding of your sufferings as I now meditate this hour. And for those which I cannot meditate, I offer you my will to meditate them, and I willingly intend to meditate them in all the hours in which I have to apply myself to my duties or sleep. Accept, O merciful Lord, my loving intention, and let it be beneficial for me and for all, as if I effectively and in a saintly way accomplished what I wished to practice. Meanwhile, I give you thanks, O oh my Jesus, for calling me to union with you by means of prayer. And to please you more, I take your thoughts, your tongue, your heart, and with this I intend to pray using all of myself in your will and in your love, and stretching out my arms to hug you, I place my head on your heart, and I begin. Third hour, from 7 to 8 p.m. The Legal Supper O oh, Jesus, you now arrive at the cenacle, together with your beloved disciples, and you begin your supper with them. How much sweetness, how much affability you show through all your person, as you lower yourself to take in material food for the last time. Everything is love in you, also in this. You not only repair for the sins of gluttony, but you impetrate the sanctification of food. Jesus, my life, your sweet and penetrating gaze seems to search all of the apostles. And also in this act of taking food, your heart remains pierced in seeing your dear apostles still weak and listless especially the perfidious Judas, who has already put a foot into hell. And you, from the bottom of your heart, say bitterly, What is the utility of my blood? Here is a soul so favored by me, yet 
He is lost. And you look at him with your eyes refulgent with light and love, as though wanting to make him understand the great evil he is about to commit. But your supreme charity makes you bear this sorrow, and you do not make it manifest, even to your beloved disciples. And while you grieve for Judas, your heart is filled with joy in seeing on your left your beloved disciple John. And so much so that unable to contain your love any longer, drawing him sweetly to yourself, you let him place his head upon your heart, letting him experience paradise in advance. It is in this solemn hour that the two peoples, the reprobate and the elect, are portrayed by the two disciples, the reprobate in Judas, who already feels hell in his heart, the elect in John, who rests and delights in you. Oh, my sweet good, I too place myself near you, and together with your beloved disciple, I want to place my weary head upon your adorable heart. And pray you to let me experience the delights of heaven also on this earth. And so that, enraptured by the sweet harmonies of your heart, the earth may no longer be earth for me, but heaven. But in the midst of those most sweet and divine harmonies, I hear sorrowful heartbeats escaping me. These are for lost souls. Oh, Jesus, oh, please, do not allow any more souls to be lost. Let your heartbeat flowing through them and make them feel the heartbeats of the life of heaven, just as your beloved disciple John felt them, and so that, attracted by the gentleness and sweetness of your love, they may all surrender to you. O oh, Jesus, as I remain upon your heart, give food also to me, as you gave it to the apostles. The food of love, the food of the divine word, the food of your divine will. O oh, my Jesus, do not deny me this food, which you so much desire to give me, so that your very life may be formed in me. My sweet good, while I remain close to you, I see that the food you are taking together with your dear disciples is nothing but a lamb. This is a figurative lamb. Just as this lamb has no vital humor left by force of fire, so you, mystical lamb, having to consume yourself completely for creatures by force of love, will keep not even a drop of blood for yourself, but will pour it all out for love of us. Oh, Jesus, there is nothing you do which does not portray vividly your most sorrowful passion, which you keep always present in your mind, in your heart, in everything. And this teaches me that if I, too, had the thought of your passion before my mind and in my heart, you would never deny me the food of your love. How much I thank you. Oh, my Jesus, not one act escapes you which does not keep me present and which does not intend to do me a special good. And so I pray you that your passion be always in my mind, in my heart, in my gazes, in my steps, and in my pains, and so that wherever I turn, inside and outside of myself, I may always find you present in me. And you, give me the grace never to forget what you have borne and suffered for me. 
May this be the magnet which, drawing my whole being into you, may never again allow me to go far away from you. Third hour, Reflections and Practices Before taking food, let us unite our intentions to those of our lovable and good Jesus. Imagining having the mouth of Jesus in our mouths and moving our tongues and cheeks together with His. By doing this, we will not only draw the life of Jesus Christ into ourselves, but we will unite to Him in order to give to the Father complete glory, praise, love, thanksgiving, and reparation owed by creatures, which Jesus Himself offered in the act of taking food. Let us also imagine being a table near Jesus Christ, now looking at Him, now praying Him to share a bite with us, now kissing the hem of His mantle, now contemplating the movements of His lips and of His celestial eyes, now noticing the sudden clouding of His most lovable face, Him foreseeing so much human ingratitude. Just as loving Jesus spoke about his passion during supper, as we take our food, we will make some reflections on how we meditated the hours of the passion. The angels hang on our words to gather our prayers, our reparations, and take them before the Father in order to somehow mitigate the just indignation for the so many offenses received from creatures, just as they carried them when Jesus was on earth. And when we pray, can we say that the angels were pleased, that we have been recollected and reverent, in such a way that they were able to joyously carry our prayers to heaven, just as they carried those of our Jesus? Or did they rather remain saddened? While afflicted Jesus was taking food, he remained transfixed at the sight of the loss of Judas. And in Judas, he saw all the souls who were going to be lost. Since the loss of souls is the greatest of his pains, unable to contain it, he drew John to himself in order to find relief. In the same way, we will remain always close to him, like John, compassionating him in his pains, relieving him, and giving him rest in our hearts. We will make his pains our own. We will identify ourselves with him to feel the heartbeats of that divine heart pierced by the loss of souls. We will give him our own heartbeats in order to remove those wounds. And in the place of those wounds, we will put the souls who want to be lost so that they may convert and be saved. Every beat of the heart of Jesus is one I love you, which resounds in all the heartbeats of creatures, wanting to enclose all of them in his heart in order to receive their heartbeats in return. But loving Jesus does not receive it from many, and therefore his heartbeat remains as though suffocated and embittered. Let us pray, Jesus, to seal our heartbeat with his I love you, so that our hearts too may live the life of his heart, and resounding in the heartbeats of creatures, may force them to say, I love you, Jesus. Even more, we will fuse ourselves in him, and loving Jesus will let us hear his I love you, which fills heaven and earth, circulates through the saints, and descends into purgatory. All the hearts of creatures are touched by this I love you. Even the elements feel new life, and all feel its effects. 
In his breathing too, Jesus feels as though suffocating for the loss of souls. And we will give him our breath of love for his relief. And taking his breath, we will touch the souls who detach themselves from his arms in order to give them the life of the divine breath, and so that instead of running away, they may return to him and cling more tightly to him. When we are in pain and almost feel that our breath cannot come out freely, let us think of Jesus, who contains the breath of creatures in his own breath. He too, as souls become lost, feels his breath being taken away. And so, let us place our sorrowful and labored breath in the breath of Jesus in order to relieve him. And let us run after the sinner with our pain, so as to force him to enclose himself in the heart of Jesus. My beloved good, may my breath be a continuous cry at every creature's breath, forcing her to enclose herself in your breath. The first word which loving Jesus pronounced on the cross was a word of forgiveness, to justify all souls before the Father and turn justice into mercy. We will give him our acts to excuse the sinner, and so that, moved by our apologies, he may not allow any soul to go to hell. We will unite with him as sentries of the hearts of creatures so that nobody may offend him. We will let him pour out his love, willingly accepting all that he may dispose for us. Coldness, hardness, darkness, oppressions, temptations, distractions, slanders, illnesses and other things. So as to relieve him from all that he receives from creatures. It is not by love alone that Jesus pours himself out to souls. Many times, when he feels the coldness of other creatures, he goes to the soul and makes her feel his cold, to release himself through her. If the soul accepts it, he will feel relieved from all the coldness of creatures. And this cold will be the sentry to someone else's heart to make loving Jesus loved. Other times, Jesus feels the hardness of hearts in his own, and unable to contain it, he wants to pour himself out and comes to us. He touches our hearts with his heart, making us share in his pain. Making his pain our own, we will place it around the heart of the sinner in order to melt his hardness and take him back to him. My beloved good, you suffer greatly because of the loss of souls. And out of compassion, I place my being at your disposal. I will take your pains and the pains of the sinners upon myself, leaving you relieved and the sinner clinging to you. Oh, my Jesus, please, let my whole being be melted in love so that I may be of continuous relief to soothe all your bitternesses. Thanksgiving after each hour. My lovable Jesus, you have called me in this hour of your passion to keep you company, and I have come. I seem to hear you praying, repairing, and suffering in anguish and sorrow pleading for the salvation of souls in the most touching and eloquent voices. I tried to follow you in everything, and now, having to leave you for my usual occupations, I feel the duty to say to you thank you, and I bless you. Yes, so oh Jesus, I repeat to you thank you thousands and thousands of times, and I bless you. 
for all that you have done and suffered for me and for all. I thank you and I bless you for every drop of blood you shed, for every breath, for every heartbeat, for every step, word, glance, bitterness, and offense which you endured. In everything, oh my Jesus, I intend to seal you with a thank you, and then I bless you. Please, oh Jesus, let my whole being send you a continuous flow of thanks and blessings so as to draw upon me and upon everyone the flow of your blessings and thanks. Oh, please, oh Jesus, press me to your heart and with your most holy hands seal every particle of my being with your I bless you so that nothing other than a continuous hymn to you may come from me. <laughs> 